Good morning, brothers and sisters, and happy Sabbath. As we open the word of God today, as we seek to draw closer to him, shall we ask for his guidance and his blessing and seek to be inspired by that which his prophet has provided for us for this time? Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity to come before you. We thank you for this Sabbath and its blessings. We ask, Father, for your direction today. As we look to open words of your prophets, help us now to understand. May your spirit be upon us. May your angels attend us. Help us so that our minds may be clear and that we may be able to understand that which is presented before us and its import for this time. I thank you for each one that is attending this meeting. I thank you for those that will watch this later on YouTube. Direct us now. Be with us. so that we may more clearly understand the messages that you would have us to give at the end of this earth's history. For this, we thank you. For this, we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as Theodore was pointing out just a moment ago, the topic that we're going to be covering today is very similar to what he was presenting this last evening. It's interesting to me because this is done without either one of us talking with the other about the, the topics that we're presenting. But this was part of a study that, that we've been dealing with from the book of Zephaniah. So the more we have dealt with this, the more we have looked into this so-called minor prophet, the more we find that this minor prophet has a major impact upon what is to be done today. So as we, as we begin with this, the Lord claims the service of all who believe the truth for this time. What exactly has Mrs. White said here? Well, Is this, go ahead. Everyone, everyone needs to be in service. If you believe the message that regarding the sanctuary, the close of probation, the, the Sunday law. Well, the Lord claims the service of all who believe the truth for this time is not the message of the three angels of Revelation 14 and the other angel of Revelation 18, the truth for this time. Mm -hmm. So he claims the service of some of those, right? No, <laughs> all of them. So if he's claiming the service of all of them, then the service of all who claim to be promoting the gospel, specifically of the three angels' messages and the message of Revelation 18, which encompass the majority of the Seventh-day Adventists, are all called upon at this time. Would you agree or disagree? Agree. They are to be laborers together with Christ in proclaiming the message of mercy to the world. Is not the message. Fear God, give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. A message of mercy. Mm-hmm. 
is not the warning against accepting the mark of the beast and the offer to accept the mark of God a message of mercy. Oh. God is committed to each talents to be used for his name's glory. <coughs> Theodore has a different set of talents than I do. I have a different set of talents than Eldon, than Chris, than Stephen. Each in the body of Christ are to work together. Can the foot replace the eye? No. Can the tongue replace the ear? Mm -hmm. If we are not willing to accept that each of us have a part to play in promoting and providing this message to the world, then we are in trouble. Yeah. <clears throat> this reminds me um, back in the mid 80s when we had the upper room Bible studies in the attic of my home. I was a new Adventist and we had studied, um, what's his name, Robert Olson's book. Uh, it was a bunch of Ellen White quotes dealing with uh, the latter rain. I, I just can't remember the title of the book specifically, but. Uh, it's about last day's events and, and dealing with the latter rain. And, and one of the things that, that struck me was the fact that the work in the last days was going to be done um, in accordance with our connection with Christ. That is, man's machinery, all of these organizational structures, which man had depended upon, because the church was in Laodicean condition, in order to uh, to spread the message, it was now going to be taken over by a direct co connection with Christ. Now, the church has never really liked this idea, the organization, because it's always felt that uh, the truth is going to be proclaimed through the organizational structure. But, you know, the reality is in many places of the world, where we end up um, with large evangelistic series where people are baptized, that the work has been done primarily by lay people without connection, without support from the church. And then the church will come in and sort of take credit for something that it didn't do. And you know, when, when we look at this, what you're talking about, uh, the different talents that's been given to each person, that we're different parts of a body, it's only as we're connected to the head that we're effective. But, you know, the foot isn't necessarily always aware of what the hand is doing. Nor should it be. Yeah, it, it has its responsibility. And... And often what people do is they want to control the work. They want to decide um, who should be doing what and where they should be working. And in um, the early 1900s, when Ellen White called for a reorganization of the work, everything had been done through Battle Creek. And, and Ellen White said that the people on the ground uh, she didn't use that expression, but the, the, the people who were doing the work needed to have the ability to make decisions on their own without uh, interference from the officers at, in, at the General Conference or in Battle Creek at that time. And, and this to me has always seemed as a very practical uh, piece of advice because somebody who's at a distance can't really understand the niceties of, of what needs to be done. But also the fact that each person in their, in their prayer time, their connection with Christ can, can be led of God 
to make decisions that may not always seem to make sense mm -hmm. from um, you know, a policy point of view. That is, policies and decisions made at a distance um, can't take into account things that are unknown to man. Now, of course, you know, you could argue that, well, the church is God's instrument, and so when it makes decisions, it's going to make the right decisions because they pray about it up at the top. But this is not the picture that's given in the, in the Bible or the spirit of prophecy of organization. We are all to be connected to the head, and that head is Christ. And there is a, is a role for elders and deacons and and obviously church order so i'm not saying that church order has no place but when the work is finally done in the last days it will be evident that the lord has taken the work into his own hands and that this is not man's doing and um anyway that's that's the thing that comes to mind as we read this I think that that's very pointed and very direct and very correct. The vineyard is the world. Here, Mrs. White is very direct. The soil to be cultivated is found in every city, in every village, in the highways and the byways, in the places near and afar off. Seed is to be sown in good works that will benefit those who have not had the light of the present truth. The kind of ministry brought to view in the 58th chapter of Isaiah is to be faithfully done. Those who are arrayed in Christ's righteousness, the beautiful garments of truth, and whose lives are being sanctified by the truth, will go forth to labor for all classes with equal solicitude. They will not be bound about by bands of selfishness, but will regard all of the world as the field. <clears throat> when we look at this, we have a definition that has been rarely addressed. Those who are arrayed in Christ's righteousness, the beautiful garments of truth, and whose lives are being sanctified by the truth. Is this presented in the past tense, or is this being presented in the present tense? Yeah, it's the present tense. We're being sanctified by the truth. Does that mean that when they are when people are arrayed in Christ's righteousness, <clears throat> that their sanctification has already taken place? No. Nope. It means that <clears throat> the sanctification is ongoing. <laughs> Justification is the work of a moment. Mm -hmm. Sanctification is the work of a lifetime. Yeah. Those that are being sanctified will go forth to labor for selected classes. All classes. So if we are to labor for all classes, we are not to turn away from the wealthy. We are not to turn away from the powerful. We are not to turn away from the poor. We are to labor for all. We are to care about each equally. There will be no I'm not happy with this person, so I'm not going to talk with them. Or they're not going to listen because they have so much money. Or 
they're not going to listen because they're poor. The message will be given regardless. Yeah. Now we all have different um, <coughs> experiences and and different types of influence um so that you know there are some groups of people we we individually may not be able to um relate to or whatever but you know uh, i remember i have a friend rick and he um he used to be a coal porter uh, back about uh 30 years ago and they wanted him to wear a suit he he was a short stocky guy with a beard and uh, he dressed uh, usually in shorts and a tank top a very eccentric uh, fellow but he was very very successful as a coal porter um and with all classes of people by the way and uh but once he's put on a suit he couldn't sell anything <laughs> and um he ended up uh getting some brain damage and um he couldn't work but what he would do is he would go to uh yard sales and garage sales and and buy stuff um and 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 then resell it this is sort of how and he had some kind of a pension as well but uh had very little money to live on. But anyway, the point is, um, he one thing he would do when he would go to yard sales and garage sales is he would do fundraising um, for different charities. And he, for one charity, he raised over $100,000. Uh, I can't wow. remember which charity it was. And uh, they gave him a free trip to uh, uh, Switzerland, which uh, he took. But, um, you know, the thing is, his ability to connect with people, something I don't have. Um, Heidi maybe has that ability. But, you know, we all have these different gifts, and, and they're not all manifest in the same way. Um, so, you know, often what ends up happening, going back to my other story, is that people have this idea of how things should be done. But because we're so individual and, and the people out there that need to be reached are individuals, um, to be led by God is the most important aspect of ministry. It's not so much, I mean, there obviously is counsel on things that we should do and shouldn't do. But one of the things about dress is that Ellen White says that when we're ministering, that we should dress like the people that we're ministering to. Um, so, you know, if you were a coal porter, you wouldn't be dressed uh, above the farmers um, selling materials to you. You should be dressed the same way, but that's usually ignored. Um, but often what, what ends up happening is we have a type of ministry that tries to reach a particular class and is uninterested in the other classes. And usually they aim at a higher class, you know, a class that has money. So of course it can support uh, the church and that, and I've seen this sort of um, uh, preference manifest in, in all kinds of work. I've seen it manifest um, in places that it never should have been. That people who had money were treated differently than people that didn't have money or even perceived as not having money. So it, it's quite important that we learn to minister to all that God brings across our path. And we never know uh, where there will be reception. If we're not reliant upon him, we never know what doors may be opened. Let your light so shine before men, the Savior declared, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. There is to be no limit to the places where the light should shine. It is to reach the regions beyond. Tell it, 
urge upon all with earnest force to give their service for those who are in the darkness of error, to teach the word of God to unbelievers, to unite our prayers for them, our duties that we owe to our Redeemer. When it is said that there is no limit to the places where the light should shine, this is a working example of we are not to hide our light under a bushel. This light is to reach everywhere. This is a time where every church and every family should be exercised unto godliness. What does that statement mean to you? How does this statement apply in your life? I feel sad as I see men and women and youth spending time and energy in self-gratification. Selfishness is occupying much time that the Lord would have devoted to religious activities. I have been shown that the money that is lavishly spent by many believers for unnecessary things should be given to the work of winning souls that are ready to perish. It is time that our people felt the need of being laborers together with God. Does this mean that we are only to worry where to give our money to let the minister promote the gospel? Does this mean that that is someone else's responsibility and not ours? How do we take this? How do we personally accept this admonition? Not just about um, money either. It's about time. I mean, she's here talking about money, but uh, I mean, money sort of represents time in that sense that, the you know, why are we, you know, working and what are we working for? What are we doing? And with our time, with our resources. And, and often when it, she says here, unnecessary things, um, I mean, these are just trivial things, and yet our time and energy should be placed upon the work of winning souls. So my question, specifically and directly, is it just the responsibility of Walter Weith, of Doug Batchelor, of, say, a Jeff Pippinger, to promote and give the message of the gospel no and and one of the things you know i was thinking about uh last night and this morning i mean because i'm trying to figure out how to use my time wisely and and one thing that i've i've neglected at least the last couple months uh is some of these papers that i have to get done so i'm trying to figure out how i can organize organize my time better um uh to complete them but you know we have these meetings you know every day and there's nothing wrong with that but other people should be having meetings and i'm sure there are there's many people who watch these meetings who also um do something similar you know in their time zone or wherever um but it's there is this tendency to depend upon other people doing something and us just passively you know listening or watching um without active study without active labor and and all of us need to be actively studying god's word for ourselves and sharing it with others and and that can be done in a variety of ways nowadays i mean there is nothing wrong with sharing with people on social media um you can have quite an effect on people's lives by how you interact with others. And, and you have lots of opportunities to share for people who are searching for light. 
Um, but we also have, you know, the people around us that often are neglected because we, we just assume they're uninterested. And they may be uninterested because they don't see in us anything interesting. So if we're studying, if we're, we're, we're seeking to do the Lord's will, we will be laborers. And this will require self-denial and self-sacrifice. It actually will never um, occur without those two things. Agreed. I have been shown that the money that is lavishly spent by many believers for unnecessary things should be given to the work of winning souls that are ready to perish. It is time that our people felt the need of being laborers together with God. Self-denial and self-sacrifice are highly appropriate for this time. We are laborers together with God the Spirit through Paul declares. If unbelievers see in our works and our lives devotion and self-sacrifice in order to save souls ready to perish, they will be impressed with the reality of the truths we prof profess. The truth that sanctifies the receiver <clears throat> will make its impression upon them. How are we to know that we will not be the vessel through which one becomes justified and can become sanctified? This is a time when some souls need to cling earnestly to God. Well, we know it says every soul. So if every soul needs to cling <clears throat> earnestly to God, is that not every one of us? Those whom the Lord is leading to do his last work in the earth are to stand as Micah and Zephaniah and Zechariah stood in their day to call to repentance and good works. <clears throat> the writings of these prophets contain warnings and instruction applicable to their time but all, also to this time yeah all the writers are writing for our time in this in the scriptures and should receive our careful study It's wonderful to study in Daniel and Revelation. But as Mrs. White has promoted, as she has showed us, the works of these so-called minor prophets should be studied carefully with the book of Daniel. And if we're going to study the book of Daniel, we're also going to study the book of Revelation. These minor prophets present before us elements that the major prophets do not. Taken together, they give a much clearer, brighter picture of that which is our responsibility and privilege to do. They should teach us to shun every phase of evil that has made such warnings essential to the people of the past and the people of today. Let every soul arouse and make diligent examination of self. That everything that would separate the people of God from righteousness may be put away. Brothers and sisters, 
in this article, Mrs. White is pointing out elements of our duty at this time. The duty that many would prefer not to shoulder. Oh, that our people would arouse and put away all weaknesses of the flesh and spirit. It was for this that Christ wept and prayed. The heart of infinite love was stirred as he saw souls being snared and selling themselves for worldly gain. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, he said, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The light of the body is in the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eyes be evil, the whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot serve the eternal, all-powerful, and the fleeting money. <clears throat> I have thought much of how little burden is carried by those who know the truth for those who know it not. Christ came to this world to call sinners, not the righteous, to repentance. Those who know the truths of the word of God are not to hide their light in obscurity, but as faithful missionaries are to give the warning message to unbelieving neighbors and friends. They are to work as Christ has given them example. All who have a knowledge of the testing truths for this time should ask themselves the question, <clears throat> Am I giving the time and labor to the work of saving souls that Christ requires of his followers? When she is speaking here, all who have a knowledge of the testing truths for this time, is she not referring directly, specifically, and bluntly to the three-step prophetic testing message that is denominated for us in Revelation 14 and Revelation 18. I would say to all our people, place yourselves in the light that you may reflect, the, re reflect light and that souls may be led to see the great soul-saving truths of the word of God. Every believer in Christ should be a laborer together with him in drawing souls from sin to righteousness. We are to keep in view the life that measures with the life of God. We are to watch for opportunities to bring the truths of the word before those who do not see and understand. Christ is not now with us in person, but through the agency of the Holy Spirit, he is present to impart the power and the grace and great salvation. <clears throat> How often do we accept that through this agency of the Holy Spirit, Christ is with us? How fearful is it for those that claim there is no spirit? Because by claiming that there is no Holy Spirit, they are indeed turning away from Christ.
if we reject the Holy Spirit, are we not then rejecting Christ's offer of his power, of his unmerited favor, and of the salvation that is so freely offered. A review of our churches is being made by the one who says, I know thy works. The need of the church today is true conversion, consecration, zeal, and wholehearted service. These elements brought into the life will make church members vessels unto honor, men and women through whom the Lord can communicate the teachings of his spirit. Is she describing broken cisterns here? Or is she describing the vessels that so very necessarily can impart the teachings of the gospel. If we look at this again, a review of the movement is being made by the one who says, I know thy works. We have come and assembled together because we believe that there are those that have been called to give this message of Revelation 14 and Revelation 18 and to give it in a clarity that heretofore has never been done. But if the movement is being reviewed by the one that says, I know thy works. Which of the churches will apply to us right now? What is the application made of the movement? The need of the church today is true conversion. The need of the movement today is true conversion. With true conversion, there is no casting out. There is no separation. There is no deciding who is worthy and who is unworthy. Because the hearts are knit together. just as the disciples had their upper room experience, just as they came together confessing their sins, seeking unity among each other. That is what we are being called on and called upon today. Now, this comes upon all. If one decides, I wish not to be a member here, or I don't agree with this person, therefore, I'm, I'm not going to listen to them. That issue falls upon them. <clears throat> we, the movement, is to see its great need of true conversion. and of wholehearted service. This does not mean service of part of the heart. Another great need of the church is humility, the deep humility of Christ. How many times have we seen in the studies that we have gone through that there have been those that do not have humility. They lift themselves up above their other brethren.
believers need to see the necessity of working as Christ worked. Was Christ working in accordance with the leadership of the church of his time? Was he not showing the great need that they had, just as we have, for true heart conversion? Oh, for that devotion and humility of heart that will lead God's people to do those things that Christ has commanded, and still in all humility and truth say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done only that which is our duty to do. I pay my tithe. I attend church. I sing the hymns that are put before me. How does this assist in what God would have us to do? when we are believing that we have done only that which was our duty to do. But many, many are swelling with pride and importance, who in God's estimation are lukewarm. Self-gratification is revealed because of a few things accomplished. Where do we hear the testimony of hearts that are broken in repentance and confession before God? Where do we see professed believers wearing the yoke of Christ? How little time is given to fervent prayer, the result of which would be the possession of a meek and quiet spirit, which in the sight of God is of great price. Over these last few months, <clears throat> As others have sought separation, I have watched brothers and sisters that have become more meek and more quiet than they were before. Character change has been happening. Character revealing is most necessary. If we, if our characters are not developed now in a time of largely peace, then what will our characters be revealed as when we come to a testing time? When the captain, captain of our salvation descended to earth, he brought with him interests of all heaven. He advanced to Calvary with all the lovers of mercy and the friends of mankind in his train. I ask, had angels of God taken the place of human agencies in administering of the gospel? Think you there would be whole regions today sitting in darkness and in the shadow of death? Were angels given power to revolutionize and prescribe the duties of the church? Would they not say, go stand and speak to the people all the words of this life? How can those who have been converted <clears throat> be so indifferent? I call upon them in the name of the Lord. Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. The Lord demands cultivation of every talent. How direct of a statement is this to you? How direct of a statement is this to me? If the Lord demands cultivation of every talent, if he is saying, show me, what you are able to do with that which I have given you. 
are we not responsible enough to understand that we are not just to bury our talents and hide them? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind and thy neighbors as thyself. Our words, our prayer, our voluntary and sincere service, our humble, earnest efforts to represent precious saving truth. By all these, we are to show our love for him who gave his life for us. Oh, that our efforts to bless others might be in proportion to the light we have received. But we do not render to God returns that are proportionate to the wonderful truths we claim to believe. There's an interesting uh, point here, something that um, other people have commented on, though I don't know if I necessarily agree with what I've often read. But here Christ is um, dealing with this, the view of the heart, the soul, the strength, and the mind. That is, we have four different aspects of man. And the question is, what are they? What what are the four things that are being referred to here? So how would we answer that? What's the difference between the heart, the soul, the strength, or the mind? Are these not steps through the sanctuary? Okay. Uh, I've never thought of them that way, but how how would you explain that then? Where's the heart? It does not the heart bring us to the foot of the cross. Yeah, so the heart is, well, it's the affections. It's... um, you know, because the heart can mean different things in the Bible, but generally here in this context, we would think of it as um, our affections, that is, and, and generally the good ones, right, if, if it's going to lead us to God. Desire, all those types of things, a, a godly desire, come from the heart. Um, the soul would refer to uh, the life that is our being in the sense of, of um, you know, it, it sort of encompasses all of the person to some degree, but it, it would, um, so I don't know how we would distinguish that necessarily from the heart because there's definitely similarity. Now, as far as the strength is concerned, that would be our efforts. That would be our actions. And then with the mind, this, of course, would be our intellect, but also our choices, right? Our will would be encompassed in the mind. But if we're, if we link this with the cultivation of every talent, what, what is Ellen White trying to say about this statement? the scripture. I would ask the question, if this is not showing us in a practical way, the unity of the gospel with the medical missionary message. Okay. We cannot have one without the other. The world around us is sick because of sin. Mm -hmm. The world around us is dying because of sin. We have a choice. 
do we represent the interest of our creator and of the great healer? Or do we represent our own interests alone? Yeah, well, it's interesting here. When we look at this statement, um, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, with all thy mind, and right. thy name is thyself. That's actually the words of um, the lawyer who stands up to test Christ, asking, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says um, unto him, what is written in the law? How readest thou? And then he answered with this response. And then Jesus says to him, you have answered right. But Jesus also says it in Mark chapter 12, um, when he talks about uh, one of the scribes coming to him, um, and it says, perceiving he had answered them well, these other questions, uh, asked him which is the first commandment of all. And that's when Jesus says the first of all commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There's none other commandment greater than these. So one of the things we can see is this loving God with all aspects of our being is connected to our love for our fellow being. But you have to have this first before you can have the second. We have to have steps. Mm -hmm. We have to have <clears throat> first and then second, followed by a third, and then hopefully by a fourth. My brethren and sisters who claim to believe the truth for this time, let the books of heaven record of you a righteous zeal. Let it be said there, as God views your self-denying, self-sacrificing works, that you are laborers together with God. I speak to all, lay members as well as ministers. Be laborers together with God. Let humility be cultivated. Christ will be your efficiency if you look unto him, the author and finisher of your faith. <clears throat> Does she say here that it is just to the minister to present Christ before the people? Is she not saying that it is the responsibility of all? When the Savior pointed out to his followers the signs of his return, he foretold the state of backsliding that would exist just prior to his second advent. There would be, as in the days of Noah, the activity and stir of worldly business and pleasure-seeking, buying, selling, planting, building, marrying, and giving in marriage, with forgetfulness of God and of the future life. For those living at this time, Christ's admonition is, take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts become overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and the cares of this life. And so that day come upon you unawares. Watch ye therefore and pray always, that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things, and shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Luke 21, 34, and 36. The condition of the church at this time is pointed out in the Savior's words in the Revelation. 
thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. And to those who refuse to arouse from their careless security, the solemn warning is addressed. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Which church is this admonition given? To which church are we to be compared? It was needful that men should be awakened to their danger, that they should be roused to prepare for the solemn events connected with the close of probation. What does this statement mean to you? Has it been necessary for us to be awakened? How necessary was the awakening for us of September 11, 2001? How necessary has been the awakening of July 18th of 2020? The prophet of God declares, the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? Who shall stand when he appeareth, who is of purer eyes than to behold evil, and cannot look on iniquity? Joel 2.11, Habakkuk 1.13. To them that cry, my God, we know thee, yet have transgressed his covenant, and hastened after another God hiding iniquity in their hearts, and loving the paths of unrighteousness. To these, the day of the Lord is darkness and not light, even very dark, and no brightness in it. Hosea 8, verse 2 and 1, Psalm 16, 4, Amos five twenty. It shall come to pass at that time, saith the Lord, that I will search Jerusalem with candles and will punish the men that are settled on their leaves and that say in their heart, the Lord will not do good, neither will he do evil. Zephaniah 1.12. I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity, and I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible, Isaiah 13, 11. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them. Their goods shall become a booty, and their houses a desolation, Zephaniah 1, 18 and 13. Many times throughout scripture, we are presented with elements of warnings that have gone before man. Many times these warnings have gone unheeded. We are seeing the example with the time of Noah that the antediluvian world before the flood was one that chose not to accept the warning message that was being presented. This world chose to say, rain? We have had no rain. Things are going to go on as they always have. There are people today that, given the warning message of the seven times, given the warning message of July 18th, set it aside. They tear apart those that would give the message. They say that they're fanatics. 
they say that they are not sent of God. They go right back to their security, to that which gives them a sense that they need not worry. Well, the leadership is the voice of God. The leadership will tell us when it is time for us to become concerned. They're not concerned, so why should I be? Is the message of Revelation 14 a peace and safety message? Is the message of Revelation 14 something for just a minister to present? What say you? The prophet Jeremiah, looking forward to this fearful time, exclaimed, I am pained in my very heart. I cannot hold my peace because thou hast heard, O my soul, the sound of the trumpet, the alarm of war. Destruction upon destruction is cried. Jeremiah 4, 19 and 20. The day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of the trumpet and alarm. Zephaniah 1, 15 and 16. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners out of it. Isaiah 13, 9. In the view of that great day, the word of God, in the most solemn and impressive language, calls upon his people to arouse from their spiritual lethargy and to seek his face with repentance and humiliation. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Symbolically, what are we seeing when we say, blow the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain? Are these symbols not telling us that this message is to go first before the house of God Are we not to apply Daniel 8, or excuse me, Ezekiel 8 and 9 here? Are we not also to combine this with the message of warning that we have in the book of Daniel? Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. Sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, let the bridegroom grow forth out of his chamber, and the bride out of her closet. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar. Those that would seek to be among the 144,000, are they not the priests? Are we then not being called to weep before and between the porch and the altar? Turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting and with weeping and with mourning. Three steps that must begin with the heart and rend your heart and not your garments and turn unto the Lord your God for he is gracious and merciful slow to anger and of great kindness Joel 2 verses 1 15 to 17 verses 12 and 13 
what do we see here? What is being addressed here? All of this is plain. All of this we should understand because of our studies, because of the conversations that we've been having over these last 40 odd weeks. To prepare a people to stand in the day of God, a great work of reform was to be accomplished. God saw that many of his professed people were not building for eternity. And in his mercy, he was about to send a message of warning to arouse them from their stupor and to lead them to make ready for the coming of the Lord. What does it mean to be aroused from their stupor? If one is to be aroused from their stupor, it is because they have taken in what they should not. Being aroused from a stupor is no different than being said that you are drunk and you are not capable of thinking clearly. So the Lord in his mercy has sent a message to those that need to be awakened, but be awakened directly, bluntly, and in some cases, violently. This warning is brought to view in Revelation 14. Here is a threefold message represented as proclaimed by heavenly beings and immediately followed by the coming of the Son of Man to reap the harvest of the earth. The first of these warnings announces the approaching judgment. Excuse me? The first of these warnings announces the approaching judgment. The prophet beheld an angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. How many of us have ever looked, fear God and give glory to him as being a message of judgment? But we are told here that the hour of his judgment is come. There are those that would look that this is a prophetic hour. Well, that prophetic hour has not come upon us. So therefore, I do not need to be ready today. I can wait yet for another season. Are we not to be ready today as if the Lord is, is going to come tomorrow? Are we not to be ready now and not later? We cannot afford to put this off even for a moment. My brothers and sisters, in your ministry, come close to the people. Uplift those who are cast down. Treat of calamities as disguised blessings, of woes as mercies. Work in a way that will cause hope to spring up in place of despair. 
Gospel Workers 97.3. The common people are to take their place as workers, sharing the sorrows of their fellow men as the Savior shared the sorrows of humanity. They will by faith see him working with them. The great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hasteneth greatly. Zephaniah 1.14. To every worker I would say, go forth in humble faith, and the Lord will go with you. But watch unto prayer. This is the science of your labor. The power is of God. Work in dependence upon him, remembering that you are labors together with him. He is your helper. Your strength is from him. He will be your wisdom, your righteousness, your sanctification, your redemption. Wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, redemption. Wear the yoke of Christ, daily leaning on him, his meekness and his lowliness. He will be your comfort and your rest. What do we take away from this at this time? What do we see presented before us? What are your thoughts? I would have to say as a group, we've been rather quiet today. Why? The message hits home. Another thing that caught my attention and sunk home was in uh, GC 311.2 that you read, Yes. He said God saw that many of his professed people were not building for eternity. Building for eternity. Think about that. Exactly. But is it also not shocking that they were not building for eternity, but he had to arouse them from their stupor? Which would hopefully bring them to start building for eternity, right? Exactly. We have to make choices day by day. We have responsibilities each day as to whom we're going to serve. We must consider carefully that which we are doing. We are each called to action. We are each placed here with a talent in order to go forward. The parable of the talents has great import on what is being presented here right now. Some are given five, some are given three, some are given a single talent. How are we to improve upon the talents that we are given? Are we to work with our talents, to go forward with our talents, or are we to bury our talents? What would the Lord have us do today? What would the Lord have us to do every day? When we are looking and comparing 
the words of Zephaniah with the words of Micah with the prophecies of Daniel. What are we learning? How can we apply each of these pieces, not only to our lives, but to our responsibilities unto God? Are we to be like Balaam? who chooses for compensation to ride out to curse the people of God. And yet he's given a message, a message that he does not hear, that he does not seek to understand, but yet his donkey understands it. And yet, Islam understands it. Sometimes God has to give us a message so pointed and so direct <clears throat> that it shakes us to the very core. What are we laying up? Where is our treasure? Is our treasure here? Or is our treasure being laid up in heaven? There have been those that I have known well within this movement. that have made their choice that their salvation is not found in trusting God. Oh, this work is taking too long. Why can't we be doing the miracles that the, that the disciples did? Why can't we do? Why are we not as unified as they were. And they seek not the glory of God, but the comfort and, and the security of the association with those that choose to be asleep. Where do we stand today, brothers and sisters? Are we willing to have faith that God is, in, is leading this movement? Or do we desire to have the security of letting someone else tell us what to believe? Are we studying for ourselves or are we leaving the study to others? to those of the conference, those of the general conference, because they have the time to study. Where is our time being spent? In whom are we trusting? What do you say? Now, yes, these words are very pointed. What she wrote in Review and Herald, September 16th, 1909, compared with what we've seen in Gospel Workers and in the Great Controversy, are all being combined with what is being stated in the book of Zephaniah. But please recognize, this is Zephaniah chapter 1 only we are all in a school we are all being taught 
either willingly or unwillingly. If we are being taught willingly, we will excel. If we're fighting against this, if we are kicking against the pricks, then are we being faithful servants or unfaithful servants? Mrs. White is correct that to prepare a people to stand in the day of God, a great work of reform is yet to be accomplished. Are we going to participate in this work of reform willingly or are we going to turn our backs on it? That's the consideration for today. So, any other thoughts or any other comments? All right, shall we then close this session with prayer? Loving Father, we are being shown our great need of being awakened so that all may present this message of warning before the world. This is not a message that is commended only to the priests, only to the ministers, but is presented for all. In this, Father, we need your strength. We need to understand how to rely upon you so that this message is properly presented into all corners whether they are wealthy, whether they are not, whether they are rich in goods or poor in spirit. Direct us now. Show us, Father, that which we need to do. Help us so that we may indeed become clothed in your righteousness. We leave this, Father, for we see our great need. Help us to understand more fully that which you would require of us. For this we thank you, and this we praise you, now and always in Jesus' name. Amen.